Good evening. Tonight, a woman tells us of the vision that brought her back from the brink of death. But first, the story of a man whose bizarre predictions went unheeded until they started to come true. The art of dowsing has long been recognized as a paranormal talent, but the tools of the dowser, the bent wire, the pendulum, are not likely to impress the skeptical. Tonight, we reconstruct one of the most extraordinary achievements in the long history of dowsing. It may even change a few minds. One night in the winter of 1981, two men left Stewart's store in Lake George, New York State. They were on what appeared to be a routine trip to buy some milk, but on the short journey home, Jack Montgomery and Tom Parks vanished. We learned about the disappearance on February 15th of 1981 at 6.30 in the morning from uh, uh, the sister, Patricia Montgomery. We had no leads whatsoever, absolutely nothing. We didn't know where these fellows were. A full-scale search was launched, which continued into the spring, but no sign was found of the men or their truck. And then the story took an unusual turn. The forest rangers decided to call on the help of a local dowser, Ted Kaufman. Ted has helped me in the past in uh, locating uh, lost persons. We looked for a woman who had Alzheimer's disease, wandered from an RV campsite into a logging area, was lost for three days through uh, miserable weather. Ted was called in on the third day and uh, was instrumental in pinpointing where she was. Ted Kaufman has been dowsing for over 21 years. Whether it's for water or a lost pet, he's always on hand to answer appeals from his home in the Adirondacks in Upper New York State. Well, shall we say, a simple request is help me find my dog. He's missing, or she's missing. Another type of request is, I lost my passport. How can you help me find it? And can you? In the slogan, of the Dowsing Society, Indigo Felix. That's my best Latin. It says the fruitful search. Now that means that if you want to, you can search for anything. Ted spends much of his time dowsing for water using a divining rod. One beneficiary was the local ski center at Gore Mountain. It had faced financial ruin when it discovered its water supply was being poisoned by a family of beavers. Beaver had contaminated the water with a waterborne disease known as Giardia, only given by the beaver. So we had to find a new source or close the ski area down. Desperate to find a new water supply, the manager of the center hedged his bets. He brought in the state engineers, but he also gave Ted Kaufman a call. We drilled where the geological engineer from the state said to, and we ended up with a mess real brackish, yellowish water that wasn't fit for human consumption. We drilled where Ted said to, we've got 82 gallons a minute of beautiful water, and it's crystal clear. You'll never need to chlorinate it or whatever. It's beautiful. But how did he do it? How could one man with a stick outsmart an engineer with a drilling rig? Ted claims it's all in the wrists and a very simple physical reaction. Well, one holds a stick, which is in the shape of a Y, like this, in each of the two hands. As one walks over the water source, the stick goes down. And there's a reason for it. Water has minerals in it. The earth has minerals in it. And in physics, it says that if two unlike minerals meet, they cause a reaction. Dowsing with a rod for water is one thing. It's an age-old technique that has gained credibility in mainstream science. But Ted Kaufman goes much further he claims to be able to map dows, to search for objects hundreds of miles away using a pendulum and a survey map. To do map dowsing, one must clear the mind completely and think of nothing else but what you're doing. You ask questions that can be answered by the pendulum swing, clockwise for yes, counterclockwise for no. It's really not that incredible. Map dowsing sounds bizarre, but does it work? Ted Kaufman's greatest test would come in the spring of 1981, in the hunt for the missing men from Lake George. In front of a bemused forest ranger, Harry De King, the dowser began his search. All right, let's see what we come up with. Are they alive? No. Are they in the US? 
Yes. You're impressed because you, you see the reaction of the plumb bob going in one direction or another. And all the time you're wondering, you know, how is he doing this? Is, is this for real? Are they in the Lake George area? Yes. Ted now knew the men were close by. His next stop was Lake George Police Station. Now watch this carefully. First, I'll sweep the vertical. I want a positive signal that the leading edge is over the location. Ah, draw the line. Now the horizontal. Another line, please. That's it. It's there. What, there? But that's the middle of the lake. You must mean down by the shoreline near the village or something. No, that's the location. Right in the middle of Lake George. We got done. I just thought he was a little bit of a whack, and um, I, I really, I, I, I didn't believe everything he was telling me. Uh, we deal in evidence, and I wouldn't order a search for that. Uh, Thank I just you wouldn't order it. For your trouble. By the time I reached the door, I could hear laughter. <laughs> well, I couldn't blame him for laughing. I mean, it's, it's most unusual map dowsing. And for somebody who's never seen it before, it can be a tickler. But uh, they were having their opinion, and I had mine. If Ted was to be believed, the missing men and their truck were at the bottom of Lake George. In February, when they disappeared, Lake George was frozen over. Perhaps they'd tried to drive across it. It looked as if the mystery might never be solved. Tragedy has struck again on Lake George. Last night, the body of Jack Montgomery, missing since February this year, was found by the shoreline. On April the 2nd, three months after the disappearance, the body of Jack Montgomery surfaced in Lake George. It was found barely a mile away from the Dowser's map position. The police were staggered. The lake is 32 miles long and in portions a mile and a half wide to two miles. And uh, he picks out a location out of a map and the body surfaces within a half a mile, I'd say about a half a mile, uh, is, is amazing. Gentlemen, our plan of action. Bob's gonna be secondary diver, Jim's gonna be Guys, safety diver. It's a blue pickup truck we're looking for. We're looking for Impressed by the accuracy of Ted's location, the police asked him to douse again for the missing truck, but this time on the lake. Hi, how you doing? I, tell you, I didn't think I'd be doing this, but then you've surprised a lot of people. On the 6th of June, 1981, he joined Ed Litwa on board a police motor launch. It would be one of the most extraordinary days in the policeman's long career. We're getting a little closer. Slow down. Ease it up a little bit. Just do what he says. Okay, sir. We were approaching the area. I began to get a signal stronger and stronger. I'm starting to get a big pull. Go left. Go left. That's it. Now a little to the right. Stop! Greg, throw the anchor over now! Okay, guys. Go take a look. I think I might have hit something. Ed Litwa will never forget the next moment for the rest of his life. Chief, we've got it. It's a blue Ford pickup. I said to myself, wow. And I just couldn't, couldn't believe that the anchor went into the back of the pickup truck. It was just amazing. But could it have been just a lucky guess? I really don't think so. I watched it happen right from the start to the finish. 
He drops an anchor in the back of this pickup truck in 48 foot of water. Lake is 32 miles long, sometimes two miles wide, and he picks this out. I think it's pretty amazing, and I watched it happen. The truck had been found by an old man armed only with a stick and a pendulum. Ted Kaufman's discovery made headline news, and even the dowser himself admits to a sense of wonder when he hears the story retold. When I heard this on television, I walked into the bathroom, because it was right in the house, and looked in the mirror, and I said, who, me? And that's just God's truth. The extent of Ted Kaufman's achievement was brought home to us when we filmed that reconstruction. We had to make several attempts before we managed to drop the anchor into the back of the truck, and we knew exactly where it was. Do you feel you have a guardian angel, someone to watch over you? Well, it's an appealing thought, but unlikely to be put to the ultimate test, unless your life was in danger. Tonight, we tell the story of Jackie Greaves, who had a classic near-death experience, one that's happened to thousands of people. The visions, the distant light, the sense of being pulled back to this life. But in Jackie's case, there was something more. There's no doubt that she's lucky to be alive. What is in doubt is precisely what happened to her as she hung between life and death. The Cairngorm Mountains in Scotland, Climbers come from around the world to test themselves here. Conditions can be as bad as the Arctic, and the notorious weather changes in a matter of seconds. On the 13th of February, 1994, Jackie Greaves and her two friends were attempting to climb Derry Cairngorm, one of the highest peaks in Scotland. Between them, they had nearly 50 years of climbing experience. The weather had been fine when they set out, but by the afternoon, it had deteriorated dramatically. Jackie and her companions weren't roped together. They began to lose touch with each other. All three of them were about to walk right off the mountain. We were walking along the ridge and there was a whiteout and I, I couldn't see sight of the others. I just fell. And I just rolled and rolled. I was just trying to stop myself with my eyes axe. At last, I jammed my axe in and I stopped. My axe flew out of my hand, my crampons flew off my bag. That's where I was lay. I lay there and lay there and decided I got so cold, I got my survival bag out, got inside it, which wasn't easy. The gales were blowing round me. I lay there waiting, hoping for some help. I didn't like crawling down there because I didn't know what was below me. Uh, there was rocks all around me and rocks below me. Jackie had survived, but was stuck on a ledge. She had no way of knowing if her companions had lived. She was lost and alone on an unforgiving mountain. Sergeant Graham Gibb heads the Braemar Mountain Rescue Team. He had hoped that no one would be out that day. The weather forecast was uh, very, very cold. With quite strong winds, uh, with very low temperatures, it would have been very unpleasant for anyone uh, lying out in the mountain or wandering about lost. Uh, about seven o'clock, we got the call uh, that the climber was missing out in the Cairngorms. The call had come in from a mountain hut. Hello, Braemar Mountain Rescue Centre. Sergeant Gibbs' team immediately went to pick up the climber and started the search for the other two missing climbers. At this stage, there was nothing to suggest that the search would take them very long. We set off in vehicles and on the way up to Derry Lodge, we came across uh, a second member of the party by the time we got back up to Derry Lodge with the team members, there was no sign of the Jackie Greaves. When I was lay on the slope, I felt very, very, very cold and the darkness came and I thought, now how long am I going to be lay here before some help comes? At night, the temperatures can plummet to minus 30 degrees centigrade. Sergeant Gibb mobilised the rescue team in an all-out bid to get Jackie off the mountain. We had quite a number of lights, flares, and during the search, we would be able to see quite well at the time we set off, we were quite confident that we would find her that evening. I saw a, a snake of lights coming in through the valley. I whistled and whistled, but of course they wouldn't hear me with the gales. It was an agonising moment for Jackie, watching as the searchers stayed out of reach. 
What she didn't know was that, disorientated by the weather, her companions had given the wrong information to the rescuers. Unknown to us at that point, we were actually searching on the wrong mountain. For Graham Gibb, the night brought more worries. His rescue teams were putting themselves in danger. Having been up there myself that night and experienced the conditions, I was quite concerned for them. For Jackie, it could have been the last night of her life. But she found the inspiration to stay alive from the conviction that something or somebody was watching over her. All the time I was lay there from falling, there was a light above me. It just kept me going all through the night. It just kept me there. I felt somebody was there with me all the time. So, of course, I wasn't afraid. And then next morning came, and it seemed to just fade away. I still don't know what it was. <whistles> next morning came, and I was so cold. It was either lie there and die or uh, climb down. So I thought, well, I'll take the chance and climb down. So I took the gloves off and uh, came down with my fingertips to get a grip onto the ice. As I got further down, I started walking and wondering, but by then I was exhausted, really exhausted. Jackie had survived the night, just. But in her desperate attempt to get off the mountain, she became engulfed in a whiteout and was stumbling into more danger. Everything goes white, the ground's white, the sky's white, and you can't see the edge. You could be walking along, you could think your next, next footstep was going to land on solid ground, and it doesn't, it lands in mid-air. There's just nothing to tell what is ground and what is sky. Jackie was now exhausted and delirious, but again, something intervened to save her. I was walking along, uh, partly blind, could hardly see, and uh, a barrier dropped, a railway crossing barrier dropped in front of me. I thought, you know, this is going to be a, a railway station and there would be a phone I could ring for help. And I leaned out to touch it and it, it disappeared and there was a big hole underneath it. I turned round to my right and started walking again and another barrier dropped down. I reached out to touch that and there was another hole. So I turned round and went the other way. Obviously somebody was telling me the right way to go. Jackie knew these visions had kept her alive, but only until now. As 90 mile an hour winds raged, the temperature dropped to nearly minus 40. The light was fading, and she knew if she stopped, she would die. But she had no energy left. I thought, I'm not going to get any further now. I'm just going to lie down here. Meanwhile, the search intensified. Over 70 people were out looking for Jackie. We'll be at the summit of Derrick and Gorm in about half an hour, and I'll call you back then. No trace of missing person so far. Yeah, Roger Graham, uh, we've got our way to the north end of Corrie Spute and uh, it's a negative result over. The weather closed in again. Jackie was near to death. What she was about to experience was common to many people on the verge of death. Was it the last imaginings of a dying mind starved of oxygen? Or was it something else? I seemed to be drifting, drifting. It was darkness. And then I was walking all peaceful through a beautiful land. Beautiful flowers, trees, blue skies, blue bridges. It was wonderful. And I felt so relaxed and away from all the pain and the cold and the suffering. The search was called off. I saw little point in risking people's lives out there in the dark, so I called the teams back late that evening. I was obviously very concerned. If she was lying out in the open, I feared that she may have succumbed to the weather and had perished. I drifted back into the snow again, but I seemed to have a lot more energy and I was able to carry on. So I crawled and crawled and, and uh, suddenly I decided I'm going to build a snow hole and get inside it. It was very hard work because my fingers were stiff and my body was stiff or shivering. So uh, I dug frantically to get in it quickly. I knew I had to stay awake all night because I knew if I'd gone to sleep I wouldn't wake up again. By the time we got to the start of the third day, I decided that to give her a last chance of, of being rescued alive, I had to get as many people out on the hill as possible. That morning, there were five mountain rescue teams, RAF helicopters, and highly trained search and rescue dogs scouring the peaks and valleys. But hopes were fading for her chances. For Jackie to survive the two nights out, I was doubtful if she had. I felt that she would have been dead in the morning. Well, morning came and I felt I was on the brink of death. 
suddenly I saw a light and it lit up a V in the mountains. Quickly put my compass onto it and that was the right way down. I saw something moving ahead of us, but it was only a, a slight glimpse and I really, I, I almost dismissed it. At first we weren't even sure it was Jackie. We'd, we'd, see, we'd identified the colour of her jacket and we thought, my God, that must be her. As we dropped into the valley, I saw this dog and the dog started licking me and, and barking around me and as if to say, I found you now. To be perfectly honest, we weren't expecting to find her wandering around. We didn't expect to find her alive. Looking back on the whole thing, somebody was guiding me right through. I don't know what it was, but without it, I wouldn't have got through. For the professionals of the mountain rescue teams, Jackie's survival is extraordinary, but explicable. The weather that was in the Cairngorms that three days was some of the worst that you could encounter. For someone to survive in these sort of conditions, they've got to have certain qualities. Fitness, a will to survive, a very strong character. And obviously she had all these qualities. Jackie herself is convinced she survived because she was not alone. I never felt alone at all. There was always somebody there. Well, there, was, there was a sense of somebody there showing me the way to go and, and uh, what to do and not to be afraid. And I'm sure without that, I would never have got through. The idea of spiritual guardians is not confined to the Christian religion. The philosopher Socrates believed he had a guardian angel and the Romans coined a special word for them, genius, although the meaning has changed down the centuries. In America, interest in angels is so great that special clubs are springing up. The Angel Collectors Club even has its own magazine. It's called Halo. I'll be back next week with more stories that are strange but true. Good night.